truth, and I believe that's us. Amen? Is that you this morning? Starting this new year? Well, it cracks me up when I see that uh, in the bulletin it says encouragement to fast, and then on the overhead it shows a skeleton praying. Yeah, like he overfasted, and there he was, and his soul went home to be with the Lord. This year you may once in a while have to go forward and say, Man, one of these days, the Lord's coming again. I'm going to fly away. You might have to say that. But in the meantime, say in the meantime, in the meantime. I'm encouraging you to fast. Say no to something. Because here are the benefits. We're going to read the benefits. We read part of the scripture last week. We're going to read them again. Let's just pick up on the benefits. God's trying to encourage us, and he's telling us all the things that we will benefit from saying no to. If we empty ourselves, empty our stomach of food possibly, empty our mind of media, empty uh, some time slot where we would have done something else. So it's a matter like Jesus, we're emptying ourselves in, in the ex expectation of filling. Amen? Open your mouth wide and God will fill it. That's what he said. Here are the benefits. Mark them down. Read them this week. Mark, I see some of you with pencils already. That's awesome. You're ready to write. You're expecting the Lord to speak, so write them down. Here they are. No, this is the kind of fast I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Amen. Amen. Uh, set, set free. Set us free. Break the yoke. Uh, lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free. It's starting, you're expressing it in your environment. We have some people that need to go free, need to be set free from darkness. Remove the chains that bind people, starting with you. If you're not free, you can't free somebody else, right? If your hands are chained, you can't, you can't go release chains from anybody else. Hey Amen. So it starts with us, and, and we're here worshiping. We're here starting to say no to the flesh. So we can say yes to the Spirit, worshiping in the Spirit and in truth. Share your food with the hungry. Or spirit of generosity, out of the overflow, God's blessing to be a blessing. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives. <laughs> what verse did you come here? I'm trying to, you got to help me here. N-A-S-B. Don't throw me off. What was that? Put that last verse up. What did they translate there? Do not hide from relatives. Boy, that must have been there for some of you. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll get to that. I noticed last week you had a praise about that. Oh, and that's in here also. There's so many benefits. We better get going because Mike wants to preach and finish his message from last week. But he asked me to stall for a little while because his message was shorter. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Okay, a spirit of generosity. In other words, God has blessed you to the extent that you're not saying, oh, Lord, I got to pay this bill. I got a covenant with an electric company. How am I going to pay the, that last $100? That's not the case, that you're in a relationship with the Lord, that he's blessing you, and out of the overflow, you're asking the Lord, what should I do with this $100? Instead of begging for the $100 you need to back pay a covenant you had with an electric bill. Amen. Am I making sense? This is the first time of the year. I think we're making sense here. Okay, for, get the relatives off the screen. <laughs> Just kidding. 
then your salvation will come like the dawn, your deliverance. Do we need deliverance in America? Do we need light and darkness? Do we need to be delivered from indebtedness? Or should I go on? Yes. We need deliverance from whew, a lot of stuff. And uh, then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward and the glory of the Lord will your rear guard. In other words, God is behind you. He's covering your back. Oh, boy. Isn't that a good one? God's going to cover your back this, this year. He just said it. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger. <laughs> well, we've got a lot of finger pointing. Any need for uh, fasting? Break off that division, pointing of the finger. We point at the problem. Point at the problem and say, hey, this is both of our problems. And we're going down. We can sit here and point at each other while the ship goes down. Pointing a finger and speaking wickedness. Mm -mm -mm. There's a message to preach here. You want to preach this next week and go from gifts to this? And if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in dark. If you, if you, then you give your desire. Look at all the personal pronouns here. Then your light will rise. Oh, Lord, let your light rise. I heard someone say this week, prayer without works is dead. So as we're praying and fasting, what is your part to do in all of this? Amen? Rise up and do it. Then your light will rise in darkness, and your gloom will become like midday. The Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desires in scorched places. There's, so we're going to have to go through some scorched places if God's guaranteeing to satisfy you and give strength to your bones, and you will be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you, listen to this, as God stirs you corporately, and Mike's talking about these giftings this morning, those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins and you will rise up the age-old foundations. You will be called the repairers of the breach the restorers of the streets in which to dwell. Repairers, restorers. In fact, I was talking to Dave Cunningham this week, and he said, you know, 2021, I feel from the Lord, is a year of restoration. He said, not necessarily reconciliation. And now he's got my attention. And then I talked to a pastor friend, and that, that revelation I transferred to him, and a light went on for him also. <clears throat> Dave Cunningham said there's a difference between reconciliation and restoration you may reconciliation means when you come into agreement there's some people that you may not <clears throat> able to agree where they stand you may not agree with their party they may not agree with their opinion you may not agree with their doctrine but we can restore a relationship of communication so we can at least be communicating the differences. When we lose communication and there's no restoration of communication, then you're divided and you're polarized and you're dead in the water. That's exactly what the devil wants. Does that, that really make sense? That's a good revelation from the Lord. We take that from Senior Dave. He moved into Northern California and him and his wife are doing well, but they're regrouping, finding a new place out in the, out in the what he would consider boondocks from Rancho Cucamonga. Rancho Cucamonga. Boy, that's interesting. Okay. If you want to be a part of this group, we start a week from tomorrow. Enneagram goes right along with Mike's talking about giftings, where you become aware of your personality, your God-given bent, and uh, self-awareness. Savior awareness is self-awareness because the Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. You can't love your neighbor if you don't love yourself. You can't love yourself fully unless you know God's love. We love because he loved us first. Does that make sense? So you reverse the order, and self-awareness is a must for believers to know what God is doing in their lives, and Mike's going to talk about that later. And so that's the benefits of prayer. That's the small group that's going to start a week from tomorrow. Thank you to all those that were here for the uh, progressive downstairs. We had a great time of fellowship. And uh, 
<clears throat> have I missed anything, Mike? Oh, another reason for fasting, January 6th, vote on the Senate floor if they're going to receive the election. There's, there's, we got, we got some uh, storms that have been brewing for a while. How they get resolved will be God's intervention, God intervening on our behalf. And so God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So we're humbling ourselves. That's another reason to fast. We humble ourselves before the Lord. We say no to the flesh, that we might say yes to the spirit. Tune in to what our part is in all this. Amen? Amen. Yes. Right now, media, let's put, uh, can you play that, Veronica? Right now, media. Welcome to our study of the Gospel of John. I have fallen in love with the work of Paul as I've studied the book of 1 Corinthians, and I believe you will too. This is where Jesus taught in Capernaum, and you have to understand this scene. The Lord is my shepherd. And over the next six weeks, we're going to look deeply into the 23rd Psalm. Right now, media. It's for groups, it's for personal devotion, it's for parents. The bullseye of parenting is to raise children who become like Jesus. It's for kids. This is Phil. We're digging into the Bible, which, as we've mentioned, is more than just a book. It's for tough times. So when you recognize that you're trying to have a conversation with your spouse and they're not ready to talk, it's not helpful to keep pressing right. them. It's for every phase of life. If you've made mistakes with money, you know what that makes you? Over 12. And now, it's yours. We've purchased a Right Now Media subscription for everyone in our church. So check your inbox for the digital invitation and download the app for instant access to thousands of biblically-based videos. Get equipped. Get inspired. Amen. That's what the insert is about. Read that. It's a free gift. It's available to you. All you have to do is get online for it. We uh, purchase that monthly. So, amen. Lots of teaching, lots, lots of stuff available. So, information and training is not an issue for we as Americans because we have it everywhere you look. All right. Let's pray for Mike and Jenny. You guys have had a busy week. You started out with um, your grandma's. Is she 101 or 102? 102. 102. And Mike, you had time yesterday to cut your hair and get the Grand Junction and Christmas party on the other side and all the things. It's been a busy week. It's, yeah. mm -hmm. I'm trying to be funny, but <laughs> it's just been a busy week, right? Yeah. Okay. So we all here. We had a busy week. All right. So let's all stand together and let's, uh, let's not wait on them to lead worship us. We are all lead worshipers. We're all worshiping God in spirit and in truth. That's the way we start the year. We're dependent on God for deliverance. So let's pray for these two, and we'll pray that spirit of worship just pick us up and carry us through this year. Heavenly Father, we offer ourselves. We're saying no to the world right now. We're coming to church, and we're saying no to something else. And we're saying yes to your instruction to come together and worship you in spirit and in truth. We're saying yes to the spirit. We're saying no to the flesh. We're humbling ourselves and committing this year into your hands and asking for your deliverance. We need it for your light to shine through us. And uh, Lord, help us to know our part in that and be responsive. Be responsive this year. And we thank you. Bless Mike and Jenny. Bless this worship set and bless the message and pray all that are sharing and testifying. We just declare this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Veronica, we're going to start with the second song. As we prepared for this this week, just knowing there's so many things going on. You know, we, you know, we did, we had a funeral, and Dan's family, Dan lost his father, and Veronica's sister got bad news, a bad diagnosis, and so we're just going to start in a place of worship today. So if you would, just enter in with that. And we're going to do communion at the very end of, uh, of our message. So we're going to start with the Father's house. And uh, just enter in a place of worship with this with this morning. The 
Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. The fear you won't define me, that's what my fight. The fear you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. And the story isn't over If the story isn't good Your failures never find on Where the father's in the room Your failures never find on Where the father's in the room Ooh, lay your burdens down Ooh, here in the father's house Take your shame
feel it, you work again. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't feel it, you work again. Even when I don't feel it, you work again. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Father, we just, we come to worship you, and we know that you're the way maker. And so matter, no matter the storm, no matter the heartbreak, no matter the confusion, Lord, we're just going to keep our eyes on you. And so, Lord, we're just going to lift up those in this room that are, you know, it's been a, a little bit of a rough season for some. And we're just going to lift them up to you, Lord, and ask for a, a blessing on them. To Dan, losing his father. To Jane, going through a, a Christmas that was different than other Christmases. There's so many, I, I don't even think I could list them all, and I don't want to leave anybody offended. But I know we have things. But God is so good. And he loves you. So be encouraged and be blessed. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I really believe one of, the, one of these Sundays we just need to keep work, worshiping through and we'll probably, probably have a level of breakthrough that... Uh, for, uh, kids, hey kids, hang on just a second. Your leader is right here, and she wants you to wait for some reason. Well, first of all, I just jumped to the end. Okay, okay. Yeah, hang on. Like Mike, she has a short message. She's filling in for somebody, and at the last minute said she would. Appreciate her doing that. I'm not trying to ridicule her. Uh, Robbie will come in just a, just a second. But I want to, uh, this, this psalm I was reading this morning, and I was talking to a pastor friend. He said, man, I feel like the warrior spirit is coming out of me. And his personality and stuff, I said, well, read in Isaiah where the Lord stirs himself up like a mighty man of war. And, uh, and in 64, 7, he said, is there anyone that will stir themselves up to take hold of, take hold of him and partner with him to get something done? And uh, he said, what was that verse this morning? I said, Psalm, Isaiah 64, 7. There is no one who calls on your name who arouses himself to take hold of you. This is the state of Israel at the time, and let it not be the state of America ever. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hands and so on and so forth. But the Lord's looking for someone that will stir themselves up and find a way. And uh, here's a prayer. And he said, I was reading in Psalm 35, contend, Lord, with those who contend against me. He said, man, that is a warrior prayer. He said, I just felt it. I felt it like never before to pray that warrior prayer. And right beside that, I'm going to read these few verses and then we're going to ask Robbie to come. To you, O Lord, I lift my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not, do not let my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. Do you hear his regression in the prayer? Let darkness be ashamed. Let those in the light 
not be ashamed. That's an aggressive prayer. Amen? Let us bear your testimony. Let us never have hope. Let us walk forward in faith. And, uh, and it says, make me to know your ways, O Lord, and teach me your path. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. And on you I wait all the day. One of the, one of the blessings of being in ministry is seeing people change. And Robbie and Tony are no exception just to see them growing in the Lord him coming out of Jehovah's Witness background. And sometime you're going to invite a group to your house and share more intimate detail of your further testimony. And uh, Robbie's with a group of men. Uh, Tony, yeah. I, st I still do that from the beginning. I got you two mixed up. Bye -bye 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 -bye. And, uh, and she said, well, I'm willing to share the blessing. So this is First Fruits Offering Sunday. And she's going to share her testimony how the Lord has blessed them financially. And uh, so, come on. And uh, take as much time as Mike will let you. Okay. I'm going to sit down because I might fall over. Um, so I didn't, I had no idea what songs were being played today. But I know that my word to talk about was perfection. And so the first song, I think, or the second song that we sang said, I don't ask for perfection, I just want your heart. And um, throughout us moving here, we have just gradually, gradually gotten, gotten more financial stable. And, but the perfection comes in because we haven't tied 10% every time but God knows our heart and God knows where where we're struggling where we're trying where we're walking towards where we want to be and um, and so now and also like communion is a lot communion and tithing have everything to do with your heart it's not a display it's not you giving money just so you can say, I did it. Why do that? Amen. So if your heart is um, for Christ and you want a better life for him and you want to live your life for him, then he will bless you abundantly, whether you give 10%, 5%, 2%, 1%. And so I just would like everybody to... Take perfection out of your mind and give what you are here for to give today, what you're able to give today. And what is funny kind of about, you know, me um, supposed to be up here giving this today is where I talk about perfection. Tony is the one who has always comes prepared for first fruits. He's not here. I don't have first fruits. Okay. But I can guarantee you that my husband will make sure he puts in next week. And, um, and then I owe Mike and Jenny money for dog food. But I know that they know my heart. I am not trying to be deceitful, anything. I just haven't really seen them to give them the money, to be honest, or, you know, whatever. But it's our heart, you guys. It's our heart. Every bit of it is what you feel inside and it's you can't fake anything with God so you can try all you want but the reward won't be as great as if you gave it whole soul pray huh oh okay our heavenly father we come before you as a group who is here longing for you, wanting to serve you, wanting to worship you in the best way that we can. And so we just ask for uh, protection over our lives, over our hearts, over our souls, and give us the strength to, uh, to rise up and to be the warrior for you that you have called us to be. Um, give us the strength to reach into our pocket and to give whatever is there um, that you have asked us to give. And you're going to give each one of us in here a different answer. 
And we praise you for that because we are individuals. We are not, we are one in union with you, but we are so different in who we are as individuals. So we thank you and we love you so very much. Um, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Am I on? Are we good? All right. I'm excited, but I only have 45 minutes, so maybe I should just do the intro and we'll do it next week. <laughs> Got to build suspense or frustration, one of the two. All right, well, I don't know. I'll do a quick recap on what we, we started with last week because we had to make it kind of quick, but I've been super excited about this message as uh, we're coming into the new year. And the focus point of this message, or the point of this message, is just recognizing how much we really need each other. And the success that we're going to find, and or the frustration we're going to find, is, this, is in us understanding ourselves and understanding each other. And as we're moving into this new season, and we're coming out, we're, we're doing our, our New Year's resolutions, and we're coming out this season all, season all about the gifts, you know, and I don't mean that negatively, I mean just, the, you know, the season of giving and, and the gifts, the gift of Christ that we settle in and we kind of just take a quick look at the perfect gifts and the, the church gifts that Christ has given you individually. And so real quick, Veronica, if we'll touch on our, our verses, just as a reminder, um, we'll look first in Romans. Do I have a ring, Chris? Up here I have a little bit of a ring. Maybe just bring me down just a little bit. Um, we'll look in Romans 12, 3 through 11. And it says, because of the privilege and authority of God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. I started there when I pulled these verses because we need to get honest with who we are and how we work and how we move so that we can, and be okay with that, so that we can accomplish the thing God has us to accomplish. So be honest. It's okay, right? I'll be honest in your evaluation of yourself, measuring yourself by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. He's given you a specific gift to do certain things well. And when you figure that out, so sometimes we get so wrapped up in even uh, the, the things we look to do as employment. Like, well, what's going to make the most money? Or what do my friends think I should do? Or what do my parents think I should do? You need to lean into what you're built to do. And you're going to find the most satisfaction and fulfillment from doing exactly what he's called you do, to do and built you to do and how he's made you. Um, for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. And your gift of serving, if your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. Jenny, would you get me a water? And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them, hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good, love each other with genuine affection, and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. And that's the, that right there is the whole picture of it all, that the gift he's given you, while you're serve, we're serving each other with our gifts, you're really serving him. That he's, you, you know, and that's what's so powerful about it, is you are doing this for him. Okay, so, so really quickly there, it lists seven gifts. And I'll bounce over. The other verse we used or looked at was in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7, which is just really pointing at that these gifts are to serve each other. Let's touch those real quick. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we all serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but the same God does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each so we can help each other, okay? 
Just kind of affirming that again. Last week we talked briefly on the fact that in um, Revelation, twice the Holy Spirit referred to, uh, referred to as a sevenfold uh, God. Just kind of revealing the nature of him, the different parts of him. And what's interesting with this is that as we look at the what was listed in, in uh, Romans, are there seven gifts. The prophetic gift, the gift of service, the gift of teaching, the dip of gift of encouragement, giving, administrative or leadership, and the gift of mercy. Does that mean that those are his only seven gifts and those are the, what the sevenfold is talking about? I'm not trying to say that specifically, but it's his nature, that he has many parts. And as, us, as many parts come together, the assembly of the many parts, you guys remember the, with our forces combined, we are Captain Planet. <laughs> remember that? Wind, water, earth, fire. Right? Well, if we get this right, there's sevenfold of God that he is calling us to be when we come to church. Prophet, teacher, you know, <laughs> with our forces combined, we are the body of Christ. Yeah. Amen. You know, we're going to get some shirts made. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're going to figure out your thing and we'll do little circles and you can run in with your stuff. <laughs> I'm a leader. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it could be really good. But as we look at these, and we figure out how to apply them to our life and how we use them. What's important is that if we don't understand these, life can be incredibly frustrating. Because as I, as I mentioned last week, if these were the only seven, I don't think these are only seven. Even later, it talks about the gift of, of like healing. But maybe these are like the subcategories or some of the categories. And then you have things underneath it. That the gift of healing would go into mercy. You know, maybe. But let's just assume for a second that there were just the seven. If there's more than this, is going to change the numbers dramatically anyway. But if there were the seven, you divide 100 by seven, it's approximately 14% per one. Which means that if you're one of those, you're one of the seven that approximately 84 86% of the population doesn't think the way you think. 86%, almost 90%. If it was perfectly, and that's not how God built it, but you get what I'm trying to say. So we shouldn't be surprised when we go to in, into any situation that somebody might be offended or confused by or in disagreement with how you handle the situation or that you, you shouldn't be surprised that you would be frustrated, discouraged, offended by how someone else handled the situation because we're different. But if we just figure out why we're different and understand that, it can bring a whole level of peace to the situation. Because it's like, well, she does that because, you know, she's this gifting. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Don't be mad about it. That's who she is. That's who God made her. And we need her in these other situations. So don't be frustrated. Am I making sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the different gifts. We're going to talk about what they are, just go through the definition, and I'm not doing this because I think anybody's stupid and they don't get the titles, but we're just going <laughs> to, don't raise your hand on parts like that, <laughs> but, but just to simple, we'll simplify it, and then we're going to go through, okay, what does this gift look like when we use it in the spirit, the way it's supposed to be used, and then we're going to look at what's the spirit look like when we're not connected with God, we're not underneath the authority of God, and, and how messy is it? And so these seven, you know, this has turned into a there's big money secularly that we can go to all kind of conferences on personality profiles to figure out who and how you are, right? Then there's a thousand different ones, and that's, and I'm not being negative about that, but even, where'd your book go? The one that we're going to do. The whole point is figuring yourself out, and the important part about this is that we're figuring it out underneath the headship of God. When I worked for Fenner Dunlop, I don't like to talk about myself like this, but it's a good po point for this story. Fenner Dunlop, which we did conveyor belts for the mine. They sent me to Bartel Bartel, which was a personality profiling company in North Carolina. Spent $6,000 to send me there for a week so that we could figure out who I was so I could be a better part of the team. And they sent the whole, you know, there was a bunch of us that went into the leadership teams. But why we were there, because this whole thing was not under the headship of Christ, it just offered a lot of confusion, frustration, and even disrespect. So you do the class, they give you a label. They labeled me a peacemaker. Now, at that time, I wasn't, because we went through a great peacemaker conversation, you know. And at that time, peacemaker to me, my definition of peacemaker was kind of wimp. I was blending peacemaker and peacekeeper, and I didn't even know that because we were, I wasn't under the headship of God at that point in this way. You know, he was my savior, but 
And so my boss was a big time driver, big time driver, the kind that you get stuff done, you do it now, shut your mouth. I mean, he'll just talk to you, you know, he's, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so he gets my report back and he starts like making fun of me with this. Oh, you're a peacemaker, huh? Big sissy. No wonder you don't, whatever. That's why you don't chew people out on the job like I want you to. He started getting really demeaning with it. And because I didn't understand my gifting in that, I didn't even know how to defend myself. So years later, we start having our, our thing. And we discover, you know, the, the Colt 45 was named the peacemaker. Because <laughs> it settles stuff. <laughs> gets stuff done. Right? And so I went to this course, and they had an FBI, an ex-FBI profiler there who he was part of the brains that put together this thing and would assess you, you know, and I was in, I don't remember a lot about my debriefing, you know, when they told me about myself, but I remember the one I go in and he goes, yeah, it looks like you hate conflict, because all these score pretty high. You, you think, <laughs> I don't know if I should share this, but he goes, you think a lot of yourself. <laughs> I'm like, so? He goes, you score really high. And I go, well... I grew up where I lived around my dad and my granddad and my great-granddad, and they were all minors, and, and when I went anywhere, people knew who I was. And so I know I wasn't a nobody. I don't think I'm so arrogant with that, but I do think that has affected who I became because people showed my dad a lot of respect, and I knew anything I would do disrespectful would affect family name and stuff, and so I knew that was part of it. But I also knew at that time I did receive Christ as Lord and Savior, and I knew I was somebody. I knew he had called me to something. I wasn't a nobody. Nobody could tell me I was nobody. I didn't believe that about myself. So that stood out. But then he says, and you hate conflict. Like, you really hate conflict. And I'm thinking, that is so weird. Because this boss, who was such a jerk, he would just run people down. And I was the only one who stood up. All, all, everybody would talk crap about him when he was out of the room. But the only one that would stand up to him was me. And I would kind of banter, not disrespectfully, but I would push back. And they would all be quiet. And it was frustrating, especially with these corporate meetings. And so I asked the guy, I go, well, how is this? If I hate confrontation so much, I'm the only one who's willing to, to, to say something and stand up. He goes, well, you hate it so much that you're willing to punch somebody in the face just to settle it before it starts. <laughs> I'm like, interesting. And so then, peacemaker comes in because like I'm not going to tolerate it you know I'm going to settle it I'm not uh, great at that yet but I'm working on it and anyway the point is is through all this lack of understanding and not underneath the headship of Christ six thousand dollars at that moment really went nowhere except for frustration I was totally irritated at myself because my boss thinks I'm a sissy I'm a pushover I don't like, co like confrontation and it sounds like maybe I'm not good at it that I'm going to be hyper aggressive basically passive I'm going to be way passive aggressive like you're not even going to see it coming kind of confrontation. And so it was frustrating. Years later, you bring that full circle, it starts to make more sense. And now I wish I had that knowledge then. I would have redirected that conversation with him. Be like, no, this is who I am in Christ. This is how this works, whatever. Any of you guys get the picture. And so all this is important that we submit everything we're going to go through to Christ today. Figure out who you are. And last week I asked you, talk to Christ, or talk to God first about who you think you are. Don't. It's a mistake we make a lot of times in Christianity is we go to someone else to say, hey, you tell me who I am. This is your relationship with God. I should be able to affirm. You know, I really feel like, you, know, you should say to me, I really feel like God says this is who I am in him and this is what I'm supposed to do. And we should be able, the leaders and the ones you trust spiritually, should, should be able to affirm that and go, yeah. You know, I noticed this about you. Remember when we were at that picnic and you did this? I remember that time when you just did that all by yourself? I've been thinking that for years, and we affirm your gifting. So I'm, I'm asking you to don't just approach this with, hey, what do you think I am, anybody, but be in conversation with God. Figure out and have an opinion of who he made you first, and then have it be affirmed. Amen? Amen. All right. The other part of this I want to touch really quick before we get into it is we also need to understand that our enemy, Satan, is not a creator. He doesn't create anything. God is a creator. And so these gifts that God created and gave you, the ones like we talked last week where you didn't choose to be great at math or you didn't choose to be a musician, you didn't choose to be born with great athleticism. I mean, some of these things, I'm not talking about the ones that you worked hard for. 
I'm talking about those natural physical giftings that you were given. You could sing like a bird, that you could dance, you have rhythm, you know, whatever it might be. And, and your brother or your sister, your mom or your dad, they don't have that gifting at all. You know, the stuff you didn't ask for. I forgot where I was even going with what I just was saying. <laughs> oh, that these gifts that you were given, Satan doesn't create things. So Satan's strategy is to take the gift that you were given to twist it and use it against you because you don't even know what you have. You don't even know who you are. It will leave you confused. It will leave you manipulated. It will leave you weird. So important. So important. You know, we know that person. We all know that person where you see that they have, a, they have some great qualities about them, but they are weird. If you don't know that person, you might be that person. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think you know what I'm talking about. I know, I know. It's a joke. I had to throw it in there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. Their gifting has been manipulated by Satan, and they have become awkward. Then maybe they're socially awkward. Maybe they can't communicate. You know, whatever. maybe they become isolated and introverted. And you see a beautiful person, but you can tell they, they, don't, they don't have themselves figured out. And this is confusing. They are manipulated, lied to, and they believe it. And it makes them weird. And so we need to rise up in this and take authority over ourselves and go, no more manipulation. I'm not being controlled. God gave me something beautiful. It's for purpose, and I'm going to use it. Amen. Amen? All right. Now, in the list, it starts with the prophetic. I moved it to the last because, when we do this, because it was actually the most profound. I think it's actually one of the most misunderstood as I kind of studied up on these different giftings. And so I'll go through the others first, trying to stick to the format. The last one will be a little bit different. I mean, it's different in part because, as you'll see, the prophetic is a very spiritual gifting for the group. It's a, a whole different class, not in a different level. It's just, it's different. Serving, giving, but prophetic is different. So we'll get into that, but that's why I'm putting it at the back. So I'm going to start with the server. What is a server? The server is one who quickly spots the needs, the person, the server, and steps in to help. They do not need direction. A lot of us would go somewhere, and we want to help. We know it's nice to help. But I tell you what, if you're the one going, hey, do you need any help? You're really not the server. The server will never ask that question. The server will, they'll know where the broom is. They know where the mop is. They know where the stuff is. They just get in, and they start getting stuff done. You don't have to ask them to help. They don't stand there. Going, do you need a hand? The server, the true 100% server gifting, they just get in. Am I making sense? I can't tell by the faces if I'm confusing you yet or just consternate, like thinking about, it. ooh, okay. Yeah, give me a thumbs up once in a while if I'm going to, okay. They do not need direction. They just get to work and they meet needs in a very practical way. Okay, so in the spirit, what is this gifting the server look like? In the spirit, this person is going to be very hospitable. They're going to be generous. They're going to be caring. They're going to make themselves available for use for all kinds of things. Um, they're always interested in making, I need to make them some dinner. I need to do so. I need to clean their house. I need, I need to go help them do this. I need to help them. They're very interested. That's their nature. And, and as, uh, before I get too far too, you're going to be at least one or two, at least two of these, all of us. We're all going to have a touch. Like maybe not all of us can sing but all of us can sing happy birthday, right? Like we could put anybody on the spot and we're going to get it pretty much right. So you're going to have a touch of each one of these. I'm not saying you don't have this and I'm not saying you're only this as we go through these because these could be received as somewhat offensive as I get into the, the, the flesh side. But the, the question is, which one are you primarily? And the point in the end is, is that as we become more like Christ, as we become more like the sevenfold, you should have a desire to inhabit most of these giftings well. Because in different times, you're going to need different ones. There's going to be a time when you're going to need to be someone who has words of affirmation. That you know how to say, hey, you, you did a good job. Don't beat yourself up. You know, you can't be like, well, I don't affirm anybody. So I don't know if it's good. Somebody tell me, was that any good? You know what I mean? There's going to be a moment for each one where you need to give, where you need to step up. And so God gave you a touch of each but he's asking you and inviting you to get really good at all of them. And look more like, are you going to make it? No, only Christ is that, but still, we're his children, and he wants us to look like him, right? So, okay, so 
finishing up the server in the spirit. They like to do stuff, make stuff, and they enjoy the physical projects. They love being a part, right? In the flesh, the server has the potential to be frustrated all the time because they can look around and they go, what, you guys don't know? Well, you can't see that they need a hand? Well, I got to do everything, right? People aren't doing what they should do. Why don't they do this? Don't they see? The, in the flesh, the server can be a worrier. Just lots of worry. Like, is it going to get done? Nobody's going to do it. I got to think about it all the time. Stress, stress, worry, worry. In the flesh, the server doesn't know how to say no. They get way too much on their plate. So can you do this? Yeah, I can do that, and I can do that, and I'll do that. And the next thing you know, they're leading a group and, you know, just putting way too much on their plate. They get overwhelmed in the flesh. And this one is, this one is probably the most unique in, in the enemy strategy to destroy them. They will, the enemy strategy is to burn this person out who doesn't utilize their gift only in the spirit, but utilize it in the flesh. He will wear you out, burn you out. You will hate people. You will hate helping because you're not operating in the spirit. Amen? All right, number two, the teacher. And this isn't just talking about a teacher, a school teacher, teacher. This is talking about the gifting, the personality of a teacher. There's a lot of teachers who are not teachers. And there's almost maybe two parts of this as I was processing it. There's the teacher who is, which is mostly what we're talking about in this description, the one who is full of knowledge and wisdom and history and talks to you about stuff. But there's also the teacher who's just really good at like coaching and teaching someone how to swing a bat or swing a golf or shoot a gun or fish. You know, the one who's gentle and knows how to, to guide and direct. So there's kind of two parts to this as we go through it. And maybe how I do the spirit and flesh don't apply to both sides, but you'll get the idea. But for the teacher, discovering truth is foundational everything else, to everything else. They love facts. They love sharing information. They are constantly evaluating whatever's going on because they're learning so they can teach, right? Well, that was, no wonder we broke down. We estimated this and there was 40 more miles to go and we only got three gallons of gas and blah, blah, blah. You know, like they're constantly analyzing so that later they can go, well, you don't want to do that. You know, we did that over here that one day. We, you know, you get the picture. Um, they're often less interested in motions and more interested in the facts. That's the nature of the teacher. You know, they want to know the details. So in the spirit, what does this uh, teacher look like? The teacher is very secure. The teacher is very thorough, diligent, methodical, dependable, usually a great communicator because teachers, they like to talk because they like to share information. And this is one I probably fall into, one of my primary giftings. I like to share. And that's why I've confessed even a lot of the sermons that you get from me are not because I'm so prophetic and, wow, look what I figured out about the Bible. <laughs> But more, I'm collecting data and information from the stuff, the study I do through the week, and I'm repackaging it going, hey, look how great this is. Look, oh, is this a, oh, I hope you can use this, right? Um, methodical, dependable, great communicators, strive to avoid pain. Teachers like to look at history and look at the past and say, hey, we don't need to do that again. Don't do this to yourself. How can I teach you, encourage you, convince you, don't do that again? We did that in... 1902, we did it in 1950, and you don't need to do it to yourself, and you know your dad did it, and your mom did it, you know, you get the picture. So they, they try to avoid pain. They don't like to learn the hard way. Teachers would rather just learn from others' mistakes, you know. They hate the definition of insanity, doing the same thing, expecting a different result. They like to point that out and try to navigate away from it. Um, they will, they are, oftentimes will try to hold people accountable to history through truth, facts, and through memory, and just the remembrance of history. All right, so um, that was in the spirit. So in the flesh, what does what does the teacher gift look like? The teacher gift is very impatient. The teacher gift can be very disrespectful. Well, you didn't know that. Are you stupid? How come you didn't know? We did that last week. Didn't you pay attention? I told you that three times already. Right? <laughs> they can be condescending. I can't believe you didn't know. What an idiot. Let me show you. Let me show you. you. Clearly, you can't figure this out. Let me show you. They can be hurtful. They're thoughtless of feelings. And they can have a really hard time shutting up. <laughs> you ever go somewhere? It's like, I just wanted to have dinner. I didn't want to hear a whole conversation on where beef comes from and who grew it the most and in what year it did what. Okay, can you just shut up? 
I just want to have dinner. I don't, I don't need to know who made this car. I don't care, right? I have to balance that with myself. I know my poor children as a parent, there are many times I was giving lessons and poor Sydney, I'm gonna use you. I tried to not use my kids, but she would get so frustrated. I would say, hey, we need to talk. And she'd go, how long is it gonna take? <laughs> Cause she knew dad was a teacher and he was gonna start. So I've had to manage. I'm just confessing. I'm taking, I'm not just do as I say. I'm saying I do as I do. I'm trying to work on not running my mouth all the time. Telling you, teaching you something, right? Okay. Next is the exhorter. The exhorter loves people. The exhorter is always positive. The exhorter loves to motivate and be an encourager. The exhorter sees opportunities for greatness. The exhorter hates negativity and pessimism. They do not hang out in that conversation. You start talking negative, the exhorter is going to redirect. A healthy exhorter is going to redirect the conversation. Like, let's look at this cup half full. Okay, you're just talking half empty. Look, this is half full, right? Um, you're going to see the exhorters, they're often going to be the one bragging on someone or patting someone on the back, trying to encourage them, make them feel good. They're very aware of and have a strong dislike for rejection, the, the exhorter does. And they're very inclusive, not exclusive. They want people to feel invited, welcome. I'm so glad you're, I'm so glad you're here. I missed you. I'm so glad you're here, right? So in the spirit, what is this going to look like when we operate the exhorter in the spirit? They're going to be enthusiastic. They're going to be happy. They're going to be encouraging and grateful, very grateful, because they're always going to be pointing out why we need to look at the cup half full and not half empty. This is good. Always pro proclaiming the good. You know, don't, don't beat yourself up. It's not that bad. It's okay. We can figure this out. It'll be all right. Don't worry. Um, where'd I go? They're very good at, at helping people feel accepted and welcome. I covered that one kind of. They're good at helping people feel special and unique. Because they're exhorted, they're going to be looking at people going, trying to figure out what are you good at so I can mention it. What are you good at so I can say, wow, man, you're really tough. Man, you are, you are so tall. Look how cool. Oh, you have the cutest clothes. I love your hair. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're going to be the one trying to make and encourage and get people to feel good about who they are. This is in the, in the spirit again. Um, they're going to help others overcome insecurities. You know, they're going to be going, oh, don't beat yourself up. You're not that fat. <laughs> That's not how they would say it. I'm not an exhorter because I just would have got slapped. <laughs> you know? You look good in those jeans. Don't you be insecure. You know, they're going to help others overcome. Right? Um, where were we at? In the, spirit. in the spirit. They're often ones with great faith. They're the ones who, when, when his stuff is hitting the fan and a lot of people want to look down or look away, they're going to be going... No, look, the God's got your back. Yeah. It's gonna, God loves you. He's got your back. Don't be discouraged. Don't get scared. Don't run away. Stand and fight. You're tough. He loves you. God lo God's here. He didn't forget. They're going to be ones that are going to come across strong in their faith. And, of course, then they're open and accepting. I kind of covered that one before. They're going to be in inclusive, not exclusive. So what does the exhorter look like in the flesh? In the flesh... They're going to have a high risk of being impulsive. They're going to not think, and they're going to be presumptuous because everything is always good. They're not going to think about, no, the boat's sinking. Oh, no, we're fine. <laughs> no, the boat's sinking. Oh, no, we're good. <laughs> and so they're going to be impulsive. They're going to do things without thinking they're, because it's going to be great. In the flesh, you have a risk of, of an exhorter coming across as fake. You know, they come, oh, you... You did so good. You sang so good. And you're going to be thinking, you just told someone I know just, just, oof, that was ugly. You just told them that too. You know what I'm talking about? Am I making sense? You're going to witness an exhorter who's not operating in the spirit give false information, and you're going to label that exhorter as fake. Like, I can't trust what you just said. You're exhorting me, but I don't believe you because you're just so worried about exhorting that you're not even being honest with the fact that that was terrible. And that girl, you know, that person needs coached. That person needs help. That was not pretty. That was not attractive. I think I'm making sense with that one. Um, they can come across insincere. 
again, for the kind of that same reason. The, in the flesh, they're typically not good at conf confrontation because they don't really practice it. They're not looking for confrontation. They don't really practice confrontation, and they're not going to be good at it. Um, they often will then ignore conflicts. The exhorter will be easily depressed. The exhorter will struggle with problems and not be a problem solver because they don't like to think about problems or try to solve problems because they're too busy worrying about, well, everything's okay, it's going to be okay, it's going to be fine. They will oftentimes be unprepared and undisciplined and seem like they fly by the seat of their pants. And they would be, well, it's going to be great, just show up. It's like, we don't have enough food for everybody. Oh, it's going to be fine. We didn't buy presents for everybody. Oh, it's going to be good. Don't you worry about it. Yeah, so it'll be one of those. Are we doing good? I can't read. I can't read everybody. Okay, all right. So that's the exhorter. Next. Okay, you're <laughs> Thank you. I needed some exhorter. <laughs> yeah. The giver. The giver is generous with money, time, and possessions. Likes to help the distressed and looks to invest in people. So in the spirit, what does the giver look like? In the spirit, the giver is going to be very benevolent. He, they're going to find ways to give. They're going to find ways to invest in people, and that's going to be the focus. Like, oh, yeah, I can, yes, I believe in you. You can do this. Let's do this. You've got this. And they're going to find ways to invest. They're going to, they're going to talk themselves into investing because they're so excited to be a part of giving, helping, encouraging, giving, you know. Um, they're, they're often very grateful. They often are the ones who are paying it forward. They, they, they give others a sense of value when they do this as part of the plan, you know, because they're showing is I'm willing to invest in you or, or give you a generous gift of my time or finances. It's saying, I believe in you. And they make people feel worthy and loved and appreciated and, and uh, like they're worth something. They, they speak to a person's worth through their giving. You're worth it. You're worth a day of my time. Um, they're typically hard workers. And they, that's in part because they want to have the resources to be blessed, to be a blessing. They want to be able to give to others, to be available to give. When they can't, when a giver can't give, <clears throat> it's hard on a giver. When they don't have time or the finances, it's hard on them. In the flesh, <clears throat> the giver buys friends and buys emotions and buys family. In the flesh, the, the giver is often wasteful. The giver spends unwisely. The giver can be extremely extravagant with no purpose. The, tr the giver tries to solve all of life's problems with stuff. The giver is at high risk of hoarding because they're, they're aware of things value and they're thinking, oh, if I, you know, I maybe I could give that to somebody and they start pulling stuff in because they know it has value and that value be something they can share later, maybe. So they start pulling stuff in. And the giver also has a risk of putting stuff over people and over people's emotions. Next one, leader, administrator. This one accepts responsibility for projects and quickly moves to get things done. They are very good at subdividing and conquering. They give assignments and get things done. They identify goals. They track and progress their goals and their accomplishments towards them. And they're always looking forward to the next project. The administrator, they are folks that just get stuff done. And when they're done with that one, it's just they have the energy for the next one. They're some of the busiest folks you know. And you would think watching, the, well, was that my spirit one? Yeah. So in the spirit, the leader administrator, they, they, of course, they're very responsible. They're very driven. They're determined. They're very organized. They're the getter done. They're problem solvers, which is fantastic and solution providers. They're usually great time managers. They're always busy making time for everything, which is interesting because you watch them and it seemed like, man, how does this person have time for anything? They probably don't. But a great leader administrator, they will be busy all week, still have a Sabbath and still have time for the family and time to read that book they've been getting to. They are just good at getting stuff done. Amen. Um, in the flesh, the leader administrator can be a real dictator. They can be bossy. They can take things over. They won't follow anyone. They can be hard to work with. They let projects become more important than the people. 
and they become oblivious or they act oblivious to the feelings. Like, I don't care what your feelings are. Like, we need to get this done. Just shut up and get back to work kind of thing. And they can be the micromanager. All right, next one, Mercy. We only got two. We got two left. You guys doing good? We're going we're gonna to be in good time. I'm not Russian. I'm American. <laughs> so that was the dad joke. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. Hey, I made up a joke the other day. Oh. Yeah, you're going to love this. Okay. What do you call a Lamborghini made out of wood? <laughs> this is a dad joke. A Lamborghini. <laughs> dad joke. All right. <laughs> yeah, I need parents, right? It was it, yeah. I'm improving it a little bit this time, yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, all right, the next one is the mercy gifting. The mercy gifting is a unique one as well. The mercy gifting has a tremendous ability to love and forgive. It's, a, it's attracted to and attracts people who are hurting. You know the mercy gifting. They're the one, who, oh, bless your heart. Are you okay? They just know. They just know stuff's going on. Um, the mercy gifting typically has a great deal of emotional energy for, for people who are hurting. And we know that. Emotional energy that goes out when things are broken or hurting, it is taxing. And if God has not given you the gift of the mercy gift, well, it can zap. If someone comes to you with something negative or sad or depressing, it can just zap you like that. But the mercy gifting, they can sit in that pocket just hold their hand all day, listen to them or let them cry, you know. Um, the mercy gifting, you'll see that they often cry a lot. And the mercy gifting is very interested in fairness and justice. And this is actually quite interesting to me about the mercy gifting because the mercy side of them, they are very, very concerned if someone's been violated, right? Right? And so in that respect, they want justice. And they want to make sure that something's been fair for the one who's been hurt. But at the same time, the offender, they're very willing to forgive. And they, it'll move forward. So it's kind of an interesting, there's an interesting balance there. Because the, the, mercy, the mercy gifting is, is high, high in forgiveness. They'll make excuses for people who did bad things. Well, you know, it was, it was a bad day. And he didn't, he, he didn't mean it. You know what I mean? They, they will try to find a way to find forgiveness and show that love. But it's both sides. They want justice for the wounded, but they're also going to find forgiveness for the aggressor. If the aggressor, of course, is looking for forgiveness. So in the spirit, it looks like very compassionate, very gentle, meek, forgives easily, does hold people accountable, though. You know, going, hey, you did smack her. You need to say sorry. Um... keep losing my spot um, holds people accountable They're very emotionally connected they walk in a room and they have an emotional meter that just you know they know what's going on and we all have a little bit of this and if you've experienced it where um, like if you go to the mall or go shopping you could spend all day in the field with a shovel in your hand <laughs> and you used to have all kinds of energy come dinner time you're kind of playful and hey what's going on if you go walk around the mall for two hours and you're just like, oh my God, I need to go take a nap. <laughs> that's, that's you with your spiritual radar picking up on everybody else's emotional baggage. Well, the mercy gifting, they, they have an even higher level of this thing and they just pick up all kinds of stuff you didn't notice. Um, they're, they're very sincere. They're often going to be one who's going to be a great prayer warrior. You know, because they're the one who take it very seriously. They're hurting, and I'm going to make time because this is important, and I am going to pray, you know. Um, has that been mentioned already? Has the grace to, to sit in that emotional place? They're very, in the spirit, self-aware because they want to know that everything they do, am I offending or hurting or affecting anyone? So they're very aware and conscious of how they move, what they say, how they speak in the spirit. And oftentimes would be perceived as being really selfless. They'll put other people in front of themselves. Like, well, I don't need these shoes. You take them. You've had a hard week. I don't need this 20 bucks. 
I have some ramen noodles, you go. You know, they're very selfless. In the flesh, um, they're unforgiving because they, in, their, in that mercy gifting, they think you hurt somebody and they don't find balance with it. They're going to be unforgiving about it because you hurt somebody. They're going to be worried about what everyone else thinks. It's going to consume them because they worry about people and how people feel. It makes them very indecisive and they can't pull the trigger on stuff. Because they're so worried about whatever else. They're, they're having all these things going on. All these things that they're worried about. It makes them indecisive. They can't pull the trigger on things. It makes them procrastinators. And it makes them avoid confrontation. It leaves them without a lot of drive. You find the, uh, the mercy gifting can be hurt easily. The mercy gifting can be very critical. Because as it, as it measures everybody and watches, are we being nice to one another? It can be super critical of everyone. It sees other people as hard and mean. The mercy gifting also risks becoming the victim. The, the, man, everybody's hard and mean. I just, it's bad. And I just can't fix it. Nothing's going to change this. It just hurts. They stay in that spot. And it also makes it where they, can, they risk surrounding themselves with broken people. A lot of times the mercy gifting feels most at home surrounding themselves with other broken people. And they just sit and they sit in the puddle of mud. And they just discuss all of the broken, painful things. It's so sad. And, and oh, but, oh my goodness. And the mercy gifting is the one, well, oftentimes when you see the person who marries broken person after broken person thinking they can fix them, thinking that maybe it make a difference, because in compassion and in mercy, they see the beautiful person within, but they're not creating a balance of that person's not ready to fix themselves, and they fall into relationship after relationship with broken people. All right, the last one. You ready for this? Last one? The prophetic gifting. The prophetic gifting was the one, even as I was looking at it, I realized, man, I don't, a lot of these I kind of had my own opinion and thought about, but the prophetic gifting was one that I've thought, man, we don't think through and appreciate maybe the prophetic gifting enough. And so as I was researching it, I found one description of the prophetic gifting that I was trying to put words to what the prophet is supposed to be and how does the prophetic gifting work and why do we need it? In the Greek, the word for the gift of prophecy is prophetia, which is the ability to receive a divinely inspired message and deliver it to others in church. These messages can take the form of exhortation, take the form of correction, uh, disclosure of secret sin, a prediction of future events, Comfort, inspiration, or other revelations given to equip and edify the body of Christ. The, gi the gift of the prophet is probably the most respected and probably the most disliked. Because of the gift of the prophet, God has compelled them to and given them the ability to, do, to see what's going on in the supernatural. They see stuff going on in our lives that, that we block and hide from everyone else. And they... And they're called to speak to it. They're called to call us out. Did you catch that one? It said the revelation or the bringing out of, of sin, of secret sin. And, and it's, it's, it's the, God uses the prophet to kind of glorify God and, and show his presence with us. Because the prophet will come to you and you'll be struggling with something and the prophet will go, you know, he'll speak to you and say, oh, you're struggling with this again, huh? And this is that week, or this is whatever, and you're hiding that, or you're rushing this, or, you know. And, and it will be that, that obvious divine conversation that you know they didn't know, that God obviously is speaking through them. But um, oftentimes when God is speaking through them, it's to, it's to call us out and to call us up, to bring the dirt into the light, and we don't like that. We get frustrated when someone calls us out. I didn't, I didn't tell you. I didn't ask you. Why don't you mind your own business? Kind of a thing, right? It doesn't mean that that prophetic gifting is wrong. It, what I'm saying is we just don't know always how to respond to it. So the prophet is a, is a seer. The prophet, most things are kind of black and white. There's not a lot of gray. They speak their mind. They say what they're thinking. They're opinionated. They're very aware, very, very aware of what's going on in the spiritual realm. And they're compelled to bring these things in the light which makes them seem somewhat con confrontive. In the spirit, they're committed, they're bold, 
they're perseverers, they're discerners, they're problem solvers, they make things happen. They see sticking points. We go through life and we get stuck. If you have the prophetic gifting, they can see what everyone else can't see and they can help you get over that stuff. But you have to be willing to be humble enough to let a, a prophetic gifting speak to you. Otherwise, it's just going to be, that guy's a jerk. Um, they see and address problems. They see a way to do it. Uh, the prophetic gifting is never the one saying we can't. They don't say we can't. They, they lead in restoration and they lead in reconciliation. In the flesh, now what's the, and the reason I went to this one last is even some of those things I said maybe sound like, well, those could be kind of a negative, but they're not. It's just that this one is one of the most unique. In the flesh, they'll be very demanding, overbearing. They'll be strong-willed, inflexible, domineering. They'll be frustrated. They may have few friends. And it will seem like they're always correcting everybody. And they seem to be really controlling in the flesh. All right. Amen. So real quick, we're just going to go through a quick um, illustration to see how does this work. And as I feel like I'm getting rushed a little bit, so I'll wrap it up discreetly, but not too fast. So when you, th you look through some of these and we think if we don't know this about each other and whether we're working with this person or whether we're marrying this person, you can see how someone hyper in administration or it was heavy administrative gifting who marries someone who's, who's a big giver, there could be a lot of comfort, uh, and, and we're talking who maybe operate in the flesh of the two, that's not spirit. I mean, under the, in the spirit, all of these are compatible and all these are beautiful and great. But in the flesh, we can have a lot of problems. So someone, an administrative, what are we spending it? What are we doing there? That doesn't make sense. Marries a giver who just spent buying everybody everything. Well, that's a fight. There's a money fight. And one of the top two, you know, marriage fights is finances. <laughs> or you have an exhorter working with a server. The server is going to be totally frustrated. You just won't shut up and quit talking to everybody. We got work to do. You know, we don't operate in the, in the gift. So you can see how knowing these things and having balance in them is important. But I went looked through some of the different illustrations of how these all fit. The one that seemed to kind of cover it the best is a picture a party where a host has invited everybody over for dinner and all seven giftings, right? The seven giftings come and man, dinner is great, but the, the host has really worked on dessert. And dessert is this fantastic, oh, it's a beautiful cake on a beautiful plate. And his dinner's over, and the, and the host goes in and grabs a cake and is bringing it out, trips, falls down, lands in the cake that they worked so hard on. That was the, the, opinion, the, 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 the focal point of the whole meal was this cake that they made. It's the grandma's recipe. So special. And I was so excited, and it took me three days to make it because you had to let it sit and whatever. Falls in the cake. So there's the host. There's the cake. They're both together, squished out all over the floor. <laughs> all right? So taking it from the, yeah, the dog's licking it up, yeah. <laughs> All right. So here's each one of the giftings in action. And what we're talking about is not just their gifting in action, but also how we could be offended by each gifting. So we'll start with the prophet. The prophet, if there was any opportunity, what's that? The Lord had his hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't think about that one, but yeah, that could be one. If there was any opportunity for maybe this to be avoided, it might have been the prophetic gifting that God would have alarmed them to. You know, hey, make sure so-and-so gets out of the way. That, that's going to make her trip or that whatever. And hey, get, move that thing. Hey, pay attention. You're going to back into the lady carrying the cake, whatever. However, in the moment, the prophetic gifting might be the one that looks the most useless. They're going to be sitting there processing what just happened. You know, just looking at it just thinking about it, processing what am I going to say? What does this mean in the spiritual realm? How am I going to? So at first, the prophetic gifting is probably not going to have a lot of motion. It's going to be kind of still processing. The service person, and they're going to get right to work. They're going to be in the kitchen now. Here's a trash can. Here's a, here's, you know, a wash, a wet washcloth, the right kind of, they're going to know where this stuff is. They're going to be there starting to clean it up, pulling it in, getting it put together. You see that one? The teacher, they're going to be given a lesson. <laughs> well, you know, if you nailed down that transition strip there, we wouldn't even have this problem. <laughs> you know, the, the risk of the teacher. Well, we got to figure this out. 
But don't you, you know that cake is, was started and founded in what country and what time? That's, you know, that's a white cake. And how that rises is like, and that frosting probably took four hours of whipping, you know, whatever. You get the picture. The exhorter, the exhorter, they, they're gonna, it's going to be okay. It does, you know, we were so full. That dinner was so, I don't even need to eat any cake. Oh my God, I am so full. Don't you worry. It was, it was beautiful. I, we all saw it. It was the most beautiful cake. If, if I could taste how beautiful that was, that was a good cake. Oh my goodness. Don't you worry about it. I am so, aren't we all stuffed? We didn't need to eat any cake, did we? Right? The giver, the giver's headed out the front door because the giver's going to fix this with money. Giver's headed to the store. They're going to buy a cake and some ice cream and they're going to be back to fix the situation. Right? They're going to be fixing it. It's good. It's, you know, the giver's going to fix it. The administrator, they start directing. They're going, hey, you, and this is where some of this setup actually should have been done before. Because the administrator needs to know whose gifting is what. To be able to say, exhorter, you know, tell her it's okay. Server, get to serving. Giver, go get the cake. They're going to be instructing and telling people. They're going to be problem solving, fixing the situation. The problem is when we don't cover this, like we're covering it right now, you're going to have the risk of a, a leader's going to lead, and they're going to tell the exhorter to go get the cake. The exhorter's going to be going, how much do I spend? Whose money is this in my opinion? I don't, you know. They're going to be uncomfortable. Hy hypothetically, seeing, you see the picture of it. They're going to tell the giver to get in there and, and be exhorting. And the giver's going to be totally uncomfortable. Well, I could, I could go, are you okay? You know, <laughs> um, you know they, you're going to find people uncomfortable. So part of the setup in being a good leader administrator is in the front side, you've partnered with the prophetic as a leader administrator. And he goes, so what are each one of these guys with giftings? And you know. And the, and the prophetic guy goes, well, this is who each one is. So don't mess that up. And the, and the, you, you, am I making sense? There's part of this to make this a beautiful picture. There's a partnership in the front side. The mercy gifting, she pours into the floor with the cake and the, oh, baby, this is so sad. You work so hard on this. It's a, don't cry. I don't know why I get a southern accent. It's just more fun with a southern accent. <laughs> I, I don't know. I listen to other accents, and they, like, I get energized by accents. And then I feel so boring when I do it. And, I, oh, don't cry, Gleam. You know, it's just like, that's boring. Throw some accents. Oh, baby. Come down. Go. Okay. It's, it's a troll. Anyway. <laughs> it, you get the picture, right? Am I doing okay? We're at least selling the picture. Anyway. So there you go. At this point, the prophetic gifting will probably have some words of wisdom saying something about how what's going on in the physical reflects what's going on in the spiritual and we're all here working together and, you know, has some great comforting information. Am I making sense? Yeah. So now let's rewind and let's pretend like we want to be offended each one of the giftings. So the mercy, we'll start with mercy. Uh, no, wait, we'll start with the, the service. They just get to work. Can't you tell she just fell down? She's hurt. Put down the broom. What are you doing that for? Can you wait five minutes till we get her off the floor? We, I maybe could have salvaged that piece of cake if you hadn't swept it up with that dirty broom. <laughs> Why'd you do that? She worked all day on this, right? Let's be, let's be offended at the server. The teacher, that one is easy to get offended at. Would you shut up? Nobody needs a lesson, and we don't need to walk around the house and inspect all the transition strips to see if another one's going to make somebody trip, and nobody cares who made the cake, or, or how the cake was made, and how, and how you know, you get the, you know, we get the history of how we make cakes. Nobody cares that this came from whatever country. Shut up, right? The exhorter, she's sitting there telling her, it's going to be okay. No, it's not okay. She's worked all day on this. And she it hurt her feelings. She was excited. It's not just okay. Stop telling her it's okay. It's not okay. Look at her. She's crying. It's not okay. You know how many hours went into that cake? You know how much she put into it? You know how special this moment was to her? She'd never made one of these since her mom died. And you won't stop telling her it's okay. It's not okay. Right? The giver. Are you stupid? You can't fix this with another cake. 
The whole point was we were eating her cake. Why'd you waste your money on that? Nobody came here to eat your stupid ice cream or your stupid cake. <laughs> just save your money. Use your head. I, you know, am I offending anybody? Are we doing okay? I'm just trying to play along with why we could be offended. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't, I don't want to come to church next week and nobody shows up. I'm like, what happened? <laughs> you don't know what happened, teacher? <laughs> like, oh, no. <laughs> you wouldn't shut up. That's what happened. <laughs> Yeah, I love Southern. I wish I had an accent. All right. We can make it natural and I can be really good at it. I'm good with that. It seems more exciting to listen to. All right, the, uh, the administrator, it's similar. Like, would you stop telling everybody what to do? We know we're not stupid. We know how to use a mop. We know how to use a broom. Yeah, I know how to use a dumpster and a trash can. Stop telling me. Stop telling me. And the mercy, you know, you, well, you're making it worse. Get up. It's just a cake. Knock it off. You're making her feel worse than it is. It's a cake. We've all had cake. Knock it off. I mean, we could be offended, right? It would have been fine, except she's sitting there crying about it and bringing it up. Stop bringing it up. <laughs> Shut up already. So we get the different ways we could be offended. And uh, there's another one where we talk about the if someone was in the hospital and each gift needed and why each gifting would be different and useful in a, s a hospital setting, you know. Someone's in the hospital, and this is also the administrative part, that as administrators we know who's in, who is going to be good to send up there to hold their hand. And they could just sit there. We need that mercy gifting. We need mercy to go. Somebody's in the hospital. Will you go check on them? You know. The giver, the giver knows if somebody's in the hospital, you know, they need some books and some flowers, some magazine, something to read. They just need to sit there all day. The server is going to be the one who just jumps in the truck and heads over and starts doing their chores, mowing the lawn, doing the things they know need done. The prophet is going to be the one who comes and speaks life into their future, discussing the spiritual stuff, talking about what happened and not be afraid. You know, prophet's gifting is to be very important to speak to the spiritual in the moment of what's going on. The teacher <laughs> is again, there's not a lot of positive from the teaching gifting alone is going to be teaching a lesson, you know, well, you know, your bones grow back at such and such rate, and it's going to be good, you know. <laughs> you know, if you just drank more water, this might not happen, and if you're taking your vitamins, <laughs> the teacher's going to have a risk of telling them why they broke themselves and why they need to do things different, because they don't want to do it again. They don't like pain, but it doesn't always seem helpful, but you need the teacher to be going, there are solutions so this doesn't happen again, and here's what we're going to do to make it. You know, if we'd had a ramp on the front of your house and put a roof over that, you wouldn't have slipped and fell and broke your butt. We're going to get, we're going to get somebody together and Amen. we're going to put a ramp on that. <laughs> yeah. The exhorter, the exhorter is going to be there going, you know, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. I know a lot of people had worse than this and they walked out of here. It's going to be good. <laughs> you're going to be fine. <laughs> exhorter is going to cover it. You got, you got the, way the, teacher, the teacher will be given the percentages. The, the minister, the exhorter, just, it's going to be, you're going to be fine. It'll be great. You'll be walking next week. The administrator, there again, they're going to be coordinating. Hey, we need to get somebody over there. They're not going to be able to cover their bills. We need to find some funds. Can somebody, can you guys get together and make some dinner for them? They're going to be laid up for a few weeks. You know, we need to get their car back from the airport. You know, you get the idea. So, I think I've exhausted my time with you guys, and I appreciate your patience. So, so we need to take communion together real quick. Jenny, will you start that song, and we'll try to shift gears over there. It's a little bit of a jerk there to go right from message to communion and the sincerity of it, but it all plays together. That well, as we take communion, we're, we're taking communion in remembrance of Christ, and today we're talking about remembering and thinking about the gifts he's given us and the purpose he's given each and every one of us to live this life, to be a helpmate, to be a, to be a worker, to be functioning in, in who and what we are. And so, um, Jerry, you help me pass out the elements real quick. Jenny, we just start playing that song, and we'll sing it in a second. Actually, would you help me pass those out? Thanks, Ron. And so let's uh, let's pray a prayer over this as they as they hand it out. Heavenly Father, as we, we come before you and we just think about this new year and this new opportunity, the fact that we had a threshold and thresholds are important, that um, 
You've called us up. And you've called us into a life that's more fulfilling, a life that's more rewarding, a life that's more full of peace. And part of that is just understanding who we are and how we work and how we work in you. And so, Lord, I'm just praying right now that each and every one here, as we, as we take this and we do this in remembrance of who you are, that we take, do it also in recognition of who you are in each and every one of us. And that this week, Lord, that they would feel the blessing of your gift, that they would feel themselves moving away, that their understanding of who they are would deepen. So we love you, Lord, and we thank you for, for what you're doing in each and every one of us. And we want to partner together. We want to work together. We want to glorify you through each and every gifting. thank you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for the, the prophet, the one who can speak into our lives, who sees the spiritual things and calls us out and guides us into a reconciliation, most importantly, with you. We thank you for the, the ones that you've given the gift to serve, the ones who always know how to make you feel special and important just by showing up and being there. Lend in the hand. We thank you for the teachers that remind us of the lessons learned and that we don't have to do things the hard way. We thank you for the exhorters who comfort us like the Holy Spirit does and tell us, don't worry, it's going to be okay. Keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye on Jesus. We thank you for the givers who remind us that we're valuable and that we're worth a day's work or that we're worth a sandwich or a dinner that we're worth something, that you show your love and your choice to make us, to let us be worthy of your presence. We thank you for the administrator who directs and assigns and gives us direction in those moments when we can be sluggish or slow. And we thank you for the mercy gifting, which even is a reflection of you coming and dying on the cross and in mercy. You knew the only way to really save us was to move and be like us and to feel what we feel and do what we do and to be the overcomer of it all. So, Lord, we lift up your body and we say thank you. We thank you for all the gifts and the gift of you and your son. And we take that now together. And Father, we lift up the blood. Considering just all the things that it's washed away all the dirt, all the stains, and the fact that it gives us an opportunity to become each and every one of these gifts in some fashion, to look like you, to glorify you, and we love you and we thank you for that. We'll take it together in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys stand and sing with us this last song.
Jesus Christ has set me free. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Father, we thank you that is the most important part. It's not that you died, Lord, it's that you rose again. So we receive that gift. We receive that gift. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. What we're doing tonight. This is how I fight my battles. It's when you think you're lost. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Hey. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I find 